Hi folks, welcome back. So today we're going to have a look at how we can improve circuit performance by adding op amps to circuits that we've already looked at. I'm not going to go through every single circuit that we've looked at and show you how an op amp might improve that circuit, but I'm going to show you a few examples and hopefully you'll get enough of the gist of it that you'll be able to do it on your own. What we're going to look at today specifically is how we can leverage the golden rules of op amps to hide away certain elements that we don't like making our circuit design process easier. So first things first, let's have a look over what an op amp is, just in case you missed some of my previous videos. Okay, so this is the symbol for an op amp. It's a special type of amplifier. It's got a lot of gain. So if we just hooked it up like this, the tiniest difference that we fed into these two inputs, because of how much gain the amplifier's got, would cause the output to go all the way to the positive supply or all the way to the negative supply, depending on the type of difference. So what I mean by that is if we say grounded this input, so this input's at zero volts. If this input goes higher than zero volts at all, the output will go all the way up to the positive supply. If this input goes lower than this input, so if it goes below zero volts at all, the output will go all the way to the negative supply. So the output follows the polarity of the signal on this input. That's why we call this input the non-inverting input, because it doesn't invert the signal. So if we swap these around and we ground this one now, if this input gets higher than this input, then the output will go all the way to the negative supply. So if this input goes below ground, because this input's at ground, then the output will go all the way to the positive supply. So that's why we call this guy the inverting input. Okay, and a special rule about op amps, we're going to assume that no current flows in or out of these inputs for now. Okay, so I've got a couple of videos on op amps, check them out if you want to know more about why this stuff happens. But we basically we've got some, some special rules that make op amps easy to analyse at a glance. And the big one is that if we have negative feedback, which is when we feed the output back to one of the inputs but inverted, which we usually do by feeding the output back to the inverting input, then the op amp will use that negative feedback to make these two inputs the same. So the real trick that we're going to have a look at in this video is putting stuff in this feedback loop and letting the op amp's cleverness kind of hide some annoying things about certain circuit elements that we don't like. So this is how we set up current sources in the past. Now if you've not seen this before, what we're doing here is we're setting this voltage here with this voltage divider. So that sets some voltage here. I'll call this VB. And then this voltage here is just that voltage minus the transistor's VBE drop, we call it, which is just some voltage that is lost to power the transistor. So here we'll call this point VE equals VB minus VBE, which is the base emitter drop across here. And we usually approximate that to be about 0.6 volts. And so what this does is this fixes this voltage here. So we then pick a resistor here. Let's just pick 1K to make it nice and easy. So that way, if we have, say, 5 volts here, that gives us 5 milliamps of current, because the current is VE divided by RE. And so that way, the current through this whole path is fixed by the transistor, so no matter what we do at the load, within reason, um, we'll get this constant current. So the thing is about this circuit, while it's very good and works very well, um, there's lots of things in here that aren't ideal, that are kind of annoying, right? So the most annoying thing is that we don't really know what this voltage is. We approximate it to be 0.6, but it would be very nice if we could know that exactly, because the problem is, is that our current depends on this value, because we set this value on purpose, but then the current is actually set by this voltage, which has this taken off of it. So we're never going to get 100% accuracy with our current source because we don't know exactly what this is. The temperature of the transistor can change this VBE as well. So we really don't know what this voltage is going to be, which means we really don't know exactly what our current is going to be. You know, if you want a precision current source, you want to know exactly what that current is going to be, then we need a better design than this. So we can make a really straightforward current source like this. So we've got the load connected here between the output and the inverting input. So what is this current through here? Well, we know from our golden rules earlier, no current flows in or out of this input. And we know that the op amp is going to make these two inputs the same because we've got this negative feedback going on. OK, so if I put one volt here, we know that the op amp is going to make this point one volt. So this is one volt here. So we can now see there's one volt across R1. So if we make R1 1k or 100 ohms or whatever, then we know that we've got 1 volts divided by 1k. Let's just call that 1 milliamp flowing down through there. And we also know 
These two are in series and no current flows up this way. So that means that this current must be this voltage, which I'll call V plus, because that's the non-inverting voltage, divided by R1. So the current is A, completely independent of the load resistor. There's no VB drops, there's no temperature variations, there's no nothing. This is great. Let's go upstairs and have a look at it in action. Okay, so here I've built that circuit up exactly as we had it on the board. And the blue signal is the output of the op amp. The yellow signal is what we're putting in to the non-inverting input. So through op amp action, what we put on the non-inverting input, the op amp will make the inverting input the same thing. And you can see here at the inverting input, we've got this 100 ohm resistor down to ground. So what we're doing is we're making the op amp put whatever we put on the inverting input across this resistor, fixing the current. And that should stay fixed independent of the output voltage, which you see here, I can vary with this potentiometer. So here I've got a digital multimeter that we can monitor the current with. So here we've got one volt on the non-inverting input across 100 ohms, and that's giving us 10 milliamps. So we should see that 10 milliamp stay rock solid across the output range. So here we are right at the bottom of the output range, 10 milliamps. And as I raise this up, try and go slowly, there goes the output rising, still 10 milliamps. Output rising, still 10 milliamps. Right, and we can go all the way up to near the positive supply, and it will remain fixed at 10 milliamps. So now the blue signal is the voltage across this resistor, the voltage of the inverting input, and we can see the op amp has made the two inputs exactly the same. So the voltage across this resistor is exactly what we set on the non-inverting input. No messy VB drops, no mucking about. Unfortunately, this isn't a great design. The problem with this design is that we leave the load, which is this potentiometer here, kind of floating around in no man's land. You want your load referenced to usually ground we often use, or the positive supply rail, or the negative supply rail. Something that's fixed and we know what it is, so we don't get any weird behaviour. So, how do we do that? We want to use an op amp. Let's go find out. Okay, so this is a much better circuit. What we've done here is you'll see we've still got this negative feedback, but now inside the feedback loop, we've got this PMP transistor here. So what the op amp is doing now is it's looking at the emitter of the transistor and because it's got this negative feedback, it will do whatever it needs to do to make this emitter voltage the same voltage as we set here. And as we looked at right back at the start of the video, the current in this circuit is going to be set by this resistor here, which we call RE because it's the emitter resistor for this transistor, divided by this voltage here, which is, this is our VE, isn't it? So the current through here is VE divided by RE. And so because the op amp is looking directly at VE, if we put say eight volts here, let's make this power supply nine volts, then the op amp doesn't care about the transistor. It will just make the transistor the right voltage so that these two voltages are the same. So it'll make this eight volts, which makes this eight volts, which means there's one volt across this, we'll say again, 1K resistor, which gives us one milliamp load current. And that's independent of the transistor, independent of the load resistor, and we're no longer limited by the output drive capabilities of the op amp because we're taking the current directly from the power supply. Okay, so here's that circuit. The op amp is output into the base of this transistor here, and then the emitter is being fed back to the inverting input. And so we can see again, we can go all the way up to near the supply voltage, and that current remains constant. And so, just to hammer home this point, this voltage at the emitter is the exact voltage, I'll put them on top of each other, is the exact voltage that we're setting at the inverting terminal. No VBE drops to worry about, and on top of that, we don't have to worry about changes in the transistor voltage can cause slight variations in the current. We don't have that anymore. We don't have to worry about changes in VBE due to the temperature because the op amp will compensate for that. We don't have to worry about anything. The op amp just makes this transistor look as though it's perfect. So we just made designing a transistor current source a whole lot easier. Generally speaking, we can hide all sorts of weird and wonderful things in the feedback loop of an op amp. Let's look at this circuit for an example. 
This is a circuit you've probably seen before. We've used a circuit very similar to this in previous videos, and it has a massive floor that's really annoying. Let me go upstairs and show you what that is. Okay, so here, these are my scope probes. This is the input, this is the output. Yellow signal is the input, blue signal is the output as always, and this is my signal generator. I'm gonna drive these two transistors with just a simple sine wave, and we're gonna see what we get. Okay, so we can see here, this is absolutely classic crossover distortion, we call this. As we go between plus and minus 0.7 volts, there's not enough voltage to turn either one of the transistors on, so we get this dead space. Now, we've used diodes in the past to keep those two transistors. While this is at zero, the top transistor is 0.7 volts above, and the bottom transistor is 0.7 volts below, so the transistors are ready to conduct as soon as we move away from zero so we don't get these dead spots. But today we're going to see if we can get the op amp to do that for us with its magic. So let's go and have a look. So I'm sure you've probably figured out that we're going to use an op amp to try and fix this problem. But where will the feedback come from? Think about it. Pause the video for a second and think about where am I going to take the feedback from in this circuit to get the output that we want. So if you thought I would take the output from here and feed it back, then you are right. Well done. Op amp is looking at the output and it wants the output to look like this. So the output, as we go up towards that dead zone, is gonna just jump over the dead zone. So go straight from minus 0.7 to plus 0.7, or from plus to minus 0.7, in order to drive these transistors so that we get the output that we want. So this is the same circuit as I had a second ago, only instead of directly driving these transistors, I'm gonna move my function generator to the non-inverting input of this op amp, and I'm gonna probe that input as well. So that's my yellow signal on my scope now. I'm going to take the output of this op amp, which is here, and I'm going to feed it using this orange cable around here. So now the op amp is driving the two transistors. And then the last thing we, in our puzzle we need is that feedback. So we're going to feed the output back to the inverting input over here. So now we've fed the output of the circuit back to the inverting input. And let's have a look at the oscilloscope. So as you can see, the op amp has done it's magic for us. This is the input to the circuit, and this is the output. You can see it's spot on. So now we're gonna have a look at the output of the op amp to see what it's actually doing to drive these transistors perfectly like this. Look at that crazy waveform. So this is what I mean by op amps can seem like magic. You can see here at this zero crossing, the zero crossing, the op amp just jumps straight from very quickly from minus 0.7 to plus 0.7 and then just carries on. But this is a pretty low frequency sine wave. What happens if we ramp up the frequency? We can see that as we ramp the frequency up, we're now up at about 14 kilohertz. We've got some distortion coming in our output because the output of the op amp is not able to change quickly enough to keep up with the input. So the op amp output is limited by what we call the slew rate. So the op amp can only traverse a certain number of volts per second or microsecond. So if you're trying to go too far or you're going to trying to go too quickly or both, then the op amp can't keep up and we see this distortion like we see here. So op amps, they're magic, but they can't do everything. So this is just a glimpse into the amazing and powerful world of op amps. I'm going to spend a few more videos teaching you some op amp circuits, but in the meantime, if you have a look down in the description, you'll find an updated schematic of that BJT VCA that we looked at previously with some of the improvements we've looked at in this video in that schematic. I've uploaded to my Patreon a video of me going through the design process for that, so if you're interested in electronics design and how I come up with these circuits, check out my Patreon where I upload design videos and tips and answer people's questions and things like that. So if you enjoy my content, please consider going over there and supporting me. It helps me out loads. If not, then make sure you subscribe, leave a like, share it with your friends, and most importantly, come back next time where we've got lots more synthy goodness still to come. See ya.